So yeah, thank you so much for coming, uh, joining us today. Uh, hopefully you've seen the artwork outside. We'll, we'll have another chance to look at it um, afterwards. But uh, I'm going to just give a sort of overview of the residence, uh, which ran from August last year till the end of this month. So we're, so we're right at the end of the, uh, the session. Uh, and it's been it's been a it's been a challenging residency, but in a in a good way. It's been um, working in a new science, which doesn't have uh, its its history is being forged kind of as we speak. There are people involved who have very differing uh, opinions about the foundations of it, uh, and this has been a real unique opportunity. I've I've worked with lots of different scientists and lots of different uh, types of science uh, and this is the first time that I've really experienced that that sort of it feels like a raw edge of of science where it's really being kind of made uh, right in front of me so uh, because of that as a visual artist you know when I came in there really wasn't very much to look at you know there's lots of theoretical stuff there's lots of uh, you know pages of maths and um, and, and sort of graphs of, of results and, and uh, the, the laser lab, which just basically operates in complete darkness, firing single photons. So um, visually, there, there wasn't uh, that much to, to sort of respond to, but uh, it really became this voyage uh, about the science, about the ways that it is uh, categorized, taught, uh, how it how it gets integrated in society and engages with society. Um, so it's it was yeah finding ways to engage with and contextualize a highly specialized and complex field. Uh, I'm sure if, if any of you are sort of work in the sort of quantum uh, sort of area, you, you're aware of how lay people respond to the word quantum. They 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 have a sort of like they roll their eyes or you know it's just it's it's portrayed as this thing that is uh very complicated like we're like way too complicated for people to understand it's this weird world of strange stuff um and and it's and people just kind of get turned off it very quickly so i, I think it's been a real eye-opener to have be in a position where i'm explaining to audiences lay audiences about the in-depth uh, work that's going on here. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's, it's you know, my, the opportunity from the IAS to come in as an artist to meet the scientists and the researchers who are doing the actual science right at the edge of it, uh, and then kind of report back um, through, the, through the artwork that I've made uh, is, is just, you know, it's, it's a really wonderful opportunity to be able to do that. Um, so my, my very high level goal sort of became that I wanted to sort of humanize uh, the intangible, the, the feeling of uncertainty, uh, and, and develop maybe a sort of intuition of probability. And, and by, by that, I mean that quantum is, is for practical purposes, invisible. Uh, it is unobservable. It is not something that we can understand uh, through our physical senses and in fact operates in a sort of different kind of way. So how can I make an artwork about that that communicates and makes people have some sense, physical sense, of the processes that are actually going on? So just to give uh, this work a little bit of context. Um, there's a few uh, other projects that I've done before which I wanted to highlight. So this is a, a video sculpture. That, that outside's a video sculpture. That's what I, I term as a video sculpture where there's a, a physical element and video content combined. Uh, so this was a very big one that I did at the Francis Crick Institute in London, uh, which was a commission uh, that sat in their front window and all of the video content was made from uh, visualizations from labs. And there's, there's about 200 different labs in there. And I spent 18 months, I think, uh, you know, really um, being challenged in, in many different ways because there's so much science going on. Um, 
and I had to sort of create this thing that could communicate to the people outside past the window uh, something about the science that was taking place there and, and the range and scale of it. Uh, and actually, as it was interactive. So as you walked closer, uh, the screen started to be replaced by video that I'd filmed within the building itself, which if you've ever seen it, it's just opposite St. Pancras Station as you come out. It's enormous and, it, and there's you know, floors and floors of it. Uh, so I got to go everywhere. I got to go up on the roof and then you know, in the heating systems and all these things. And again, it's the sort of revealing, uh, the, the idea was that the closer you got, the more was revealed. And, and this is kind of a running theme across most of the sciences, I think. Um, as Young Chan mentioned, I've, I've done a lot of uh, robotic work. Uh, this was a, an underwater robot that um, I developed with uh, artist Anna Dimitri, uh, and this is based on Archaea, which are, are believed to be the oldest life forms on Earth and live on sort of deep sea vents. And, uh, and the science, we worked with Imperial uh, College, they were studying these, these little motors, the, the uh, genetic motors that are very, very simple and they're trying to replicate them through uh, cryomicroscopy and things. So um, it, for this one, we were sort of using like direct science, direct research within the, within the work. Um, also done a project called Fermenting Futures with Anna, uh, which is about yeast microbiology. Uh, so we've, we've just installed this in uh, Musée de la Man in, in Switzerland um, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and this is based on a sort of bioreactor and used photogrammetry to scan real yeast colonies and then sort of uh, print them out. And this was uh, a sort of set of building, this piece is called culture, and the breadcrumbs are made from genetically modified yeast, which um, was, was developed in a, in a lab in uh, Vienna, at Boku University. Uh, and finally, this is uh, Physic AI Gun, another collaboration with Anna, uh, which was about uh, having a big machine learning system for drug interactions for cancer patients. So, each uh, flower represents a different drug, and this is somebody interacting with it. You can plant different plants, and then they grow together. And then, but if the drugs don't react well together, then the drug, you know, the flowers will like like get sick and die. Uh, so the idea is to have a sort of flourishing uh, garden based on the idea of sort of physics gardens. And, um, so I'm just sort of racing through those because just to sort of give you an idea of the. Uh, the sort of range of, of uh, things I've been working with. Uh, which brings us to, to this piece, uh, the Cabinet of Intangible Curiosities. Uh, and these are the sort of questions that I was thinking about um, over the course of the residency. Uh, how do we collect something we cannot see? Uh, how can we collect something that are, that are affected by being measured, by being observed? Uh, the sort of the people have a fear of the invisible. We have a we have a sort of uh, like it's 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 like sympathetic medicine. You know, when people used to think that you know uh, that if you if you were sort of sick, it was because you had too much you know, an imbalance in your sort of fluids in your body. Um, and we we've moved on so far using technology that we can't see uh, physically the things that that are sort of. Um, that are affecting us and, and that, you know, so people lose physical contact with those things. And I think, I think that creates a, a space for uh, fear and, and sort of paranoia. Uh, things that cannot be intuitively understood. Quantum mechanics is very well defined, but it's not intuitive on a kind of, uh, for a sort of lay audience. Uh, you're forced to engage with probabilities and uncertainties. So this, this is a, a collection of things that I have either been thinking about or have engaged with over the course of the residency. So this is, this is not an objective collection. This is not a presentation of, of this is the science of quantum biology. This is very much my uh, journey through it over the past uh, year. Uh, and there are elements of, of history, of science, societal attitudes. Um, 
so the the design of this um, and and I kind of had this in mind very much from the from the start from our uh, earliest discussions with um, myself and Young Chan the 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 idea of these these cabinets of curiosities which were uh, big in the sort of seventeenth uh, eighteenth century uh, you know explorers will go to the far reaches of the earth and sort of bring back uh, artifacts and and these would form collections usually of the the rich and the wealthy these are private collections um, and they presented like like several challenges because uh, if they found a, a bird or something, this was before taxidermy as we know it. So, so you couldn't just sort of uh, preserve the bird and have it in your collection. Uh, so they would either have illustrations um, and paintings, uh, or they would take you know feathers or bones or you know some artifact of the uh, you know it's like the narwhal tusk, uh, sort of you know and the shells of, of uh, turtles and things. Um, things that could be transported, stored, added to the collection. So the idea for this artwork was, well, you can't collect quantum things because they're, they're fleeting, they're tiny, they're, they're unobservable. Um, what artifacts could there be around quantum, around quantum biology uh, that I could collect and could uh, put into a, into a collection? So that, that was really the structure of the uh, of the the piece and and the the structure of the the residency um, and I, and there's so much kind of thought i mean you know with every artwork pretty much there's so much thought that you'll never get to see and designs these are sort of different layouts for uh for the shelving uh, of it uh, and i was sort of working with uh, different kind of structures um just endless uh, sort of drawings and sketches of, of, you know, what it might look like um, as a sort of trying to piece together the, the structure of it and, and what could go inside it. Uh, lots and lots of just little drawings in boxes of uh, ideas. So you'll see that there are some of the things in here that, that actually made it through to the, uh, the final piece. There's, there's the robin in the... Uh, in the in the chamber, I'll talk a little bit about that. There's this sort of Schrodinger's cat. Uh, there's the the um, entangled. Uh, they weren't going to be dancers originally. There was um, the two green figures in the in one of the thing. They they had this idea they were going to be these sort of dancers uh, that were entang uh, quantum entangled uh, by. Um, uh, but I, I didn't go for dancers in the end. Um, and just over the months, just kept, you know, devising the um, the ideas and, and what I wanted to represent and how it was all going to relate. And uh, so it was, you know, very, very, um, quite a long process. Came to Surrey, had a conversation with Yang Chan, had conversations with uh, other researchers and talked a lot uh, around the science and, and as well as um, about specific stuff. Uh, and then the construction of it. Um, so with, as with the, ca with the cameras, I like, I like do everything because uh, I don't know how sensible that is, but, but that's what I do. So I designed the cabinet in uh, the 3D software blender, uh, sort of, and then uh, made it by hand, um, literally from, uh, from scratch, from wood. So... Um, made the whole thing, design, you know, so it was all, all my own design and painted it and uh, found a ways to sort of cut the, the little plastic uh, jars in half. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so, so, cause I, I was thinking I could hire someone and I could just outsource it and get, you know, cause it's certainly not a brilliant piece of cabinet making. That wasn't the point. Uh, I felt like, um, especially at the moment where we're faced with artists and uh, AI art and the, 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 the hand of the artist in the work seems really important at the moment. Um, 
so by making the cabinet, it's not perfect. You know, don't go looking for the little imperfections. It's, it's fine. Um, but it is by my own hand. It is, it is a thing that I have made. Um, and that, you know, maybe it's just me, but, you know, I, I feel that that's kind of uh, gives, it makes me more satisfied uh, for the whole, the whole piece. Um, and then each piece of video within it was 3D modeled by me uh, and animated. And, and so each piece was done separately. And then the final uh, composition was, was compiled by taking all those video clips uh, and laying it out within the, within the finished uh, frame. Um, so obviously there's, there's a lot of parts of it and I'm not gonna run through all of them, but I'm just gonna give you a few uh, highlights, uh, again, just to sort of show the range of things that, that, uh, that are sort of covered within the piece. So as well as quantum biology, there's been this, this parallel project here called the Arrow of Time, which is another Templeton funded project. Uh, and I've always been very interested in time and memory. And I really thought quantum biology and quantum mechanics related to that. So it's sort of merged into that uh, project a little bit as well. Uh, and there's a clock at the top left corner. But if you watch it, the sort of second hand goes around and then it jumps back. Um, I think it's like about a 20 second uh, period there. And the point of that is to show that although there's a linearity to the time within the piece, uh, the time is not passing. It keeps jumping back. It is, it is something that is held sort of within time. Uh, and this was the, the uh, Zeno's arrow, which is, was a sort of paradox um, uh, presented by, by the uh, philosopher Zeno, which was like, if you've got an arrow in flight, and if you took a moment, you know, and then took, you know, took another moment, in these moments, it's not moving. Uh, so is the arrow actually moving if you look at it uh, in, a, in a single moment? And then that always related back to my thoughts on photography. And, uh, but then, you know, it quickly spirals outside of the scope of the, of the work. Um, there's uh, quite a few areas which are devoted to the, the European robin. Um, and this was because the kind of birth of, of quantum biology as a science really came from the study of the uh, enzyme uh, cryptochrome in, in the eye of the, the European robin. And it allows it to navigate the Earth's magnetic field. Um, basically, the, the magnetic field is, is incredibly weak. Uh, and, you know, it's far too weak for, for any uh, sort of physical process to sort of pick up. But they found that, that birds obviously can navigate north to south. Uh, and they found that this, this cryptochrome enzyme in the eye responded to sort of the magnetic field and the uh, photon of blue light uh, and created and basically enabled it to see the magnetic field and was able to fly, uh, use it to fly north to south. And this is believed to be uh, a sort of quantum uh, effect sort of taking place. And we've since discovered that cryptochrome is in the eyes of many other animals, bees and ants and I think. Um, so it's, it's a sort of really core part of the, the story. And uh, this, this particular image was uh, from a documentary that Jim Al-Khalili did, which obviously I've watched loads of because, you know, for research. And there was this, uh, so there's this robin put in a machine that can uh, have a magnetic field moved around the robin. So it's like a Faraday cage and then this magnetic field around it. Uh, and then this paper that the robin sort of flies at and scratches at, uh, and it might makes a mark. And so it basically shows that it can see the magnetic field and, and they, they did lots of experiments with that. Um, and it's sort of, it's, you know, just giving a, a nod to the fact that we, you know, the use of animals in science, uh, you know, they are, they are part of the story. They are sort of uh, collaborators in, in this thing. Um, spherical cows, obviously, um, is from a 
a theoretical physics joke. So uh, this, this joke worked really well the other day when I told it to a bunch of theoretical physicists. So I'm, I don't know if it's gonna, if it's gonna work quite as well, but um, basically there, there was a, a, a dairy farmer and their milk production was down at the, at the farm. So they asked a bunch of theoretical physicists if they could help and you know, come up with a solution. Uh, and they go away for a few days and they come back and they go, we've got a solution, um, but it only works for spherical cows in a vacuum. Yeah, some of you. <laughs> um, and that's and it's a famous joke, but but it's and it's you know, uh, but I was quite taken with it because it spoke about the fact that you don't need to understand every kind of little bit of science along the way to understand uh, the thing that you're dealing with. You know, sometimes, and I found this across like all sciences, like there are. There are things that we understand, and then there are these little gaps where we don't, or it's so complicated that we that we have to uh, have a, a a spherical, you know, simplified version of that model just so we can get past it and actually work on the thing that we wanted to. Uh, and also, sort of like how we tell people about science, and there's several parts of the thing, uh, the sculpture where there are representations of uh, atoms but in different levels of, of complexity, um, which sort of references how we, how we teach science at different levels. Um, the green figures that I mentioned earlier, uh, so this was uh, based on research in the, here at, at Surrey, in the biophotonics lab, uh, where they basically had two um, fluorophores distanced apart by, by 10, bases of DNA, which is, is, turns out is a very accurate uh, ruler. And I, I was really like that idea. So, and then you fire one green photon at, at one of them, and then they actually act uh, in entangled in an entangled state. So this, this is my, um, my sort of representation of, um, of that work. And the point about doing it like this is, is it's not, this isn't science communication. These, every one of these is provides a talking point. It provides something that we can talk around the science. So a little bit like the spherical cow, but it's, it's, we, can, we can communicate something without getting bogged down within the details. Uh, and similar for, the, for this one, which was uh, about uh, quantum tunneling and the idea that, that uh, you know, you've got an electron of an atom and there's a cloud of possibilities of where it might be found. And if it gets close enough to a very thin object, represented by the large uh, building there, um, the cloud can actually appear on the other side. And so you, there's a possibility that you might find it on the other side, seemingly having traveled through this solid barrier. Now, obviously, I've scaled it up a, just a little bit. Um, but it, it sort of felt like a way of, of um, communicating something quite uh, profound about quantum mechanics in just a very sort of visual way. There's a slight hint of, um, um, you know, Magritte and, and uh, sort of things like that. So, um, and then finally, um, classic Schrodinger's cat. Uh, which is, I, I thought I was, rather than try and represent the thought experiment itself, I was thinking about all the times that people had thought about this thought experiment. And that, that there was this, this sort of mummified, Egyptian mummified cat uh, uh, spirit of, uh, of this cat, that basically the thought of the cat was alive that culturally it had been amalgamated into our sort of social uh, zeitgeist and, and that, that it's alive as long as we remember it. It's sort of taken on its own sort of life. So I know some people have, a, have a, an issue with, with this as a thought experiment, and, uh, but I think it's sort of undeniable that it's taken on its own uh, sort of existence. Uh, and I wanted to um, you know, have, it, have it represented. Uh, in the work, um, I, I, 
each one of these, I did quite a lot of weird research. I was, I was thought, well, what, what breed of cat would it have been? Um, and it would, probably would have been a, a Maltese cat. Uh, Austria in the early 1900s uh, were famous for that kind of breed. Um, and Schrodinger actually, he had dogs. He actually hated cats, uh, which is probably why there's a cat in the box with the, with the poison rather than the, uh, rather than the dog. Um, so I want to get briefly touch about one, but I think we're going to we're going to discuss that. Um, so I just wanted to say uh, thank you to the IS for having me, and uh, I think the residency program is fantastic. I think it's really important. I think you know getting artists into, you know, obviously I'm I'm slightly biased on this, but you know being able to sort of come in and work with the real scientists doing the real science. Uh, and, and being able to sort of report back to um, different audiences, engaging with different audiences around the world, uh, is is just really important part of, of uh, bringing everyone along on these sort of scientific journeys. Um, so I'm, I'm very, as you might be able to tell, very positive on this, this uh, sort of structure of things. So it's been a great opportunity. And obviously, Young Chan, thank you so much for hosting me and. Um, answering all of my stupid questions uh, very, very patiently. Um, so yeah, thank you.